All right. Um, now, remember in Revelation chapter 13, um, it concludes with uh, that number, okay? That mark of the beast, if we want to call it that. Now, in Revelation 13, the mark of the beast, as we saw, uh, it affected all uh, the beast himself, affected three issues that we discussed the last time, okay? So we know that from the first beast to, he, to the second beast and to the image, because there are three elements there. We saw that there's the first beast, okay, uh, who comes uh, from the sea, then there's the second beast, the land beast, and the third, which is the image of the beast, and we saw there are different roles there. We saw that the first beast uh, primarily uh, desired that he should be worshipped, the first beast, we saw that the other beast uh, came up with political power, uh, leading to war, persecuting, destroying, and leading uh, others to worship the first beast. And then we saw the image of the beast uh, that was given uh, the power to talk, talk blasphemous things. But also very importantly, that the, the image of the beast, those who don't worship the image of the beast, were not given the right to, to, to buy nor to sell, okay? And of course, that is where the conspiracy theories then come out about uh, barcodes and chips and all of that, all right? And, and the historical background to it is actually quite clear. Now, what John is giving us, uh, or rather, God is giving John a vision of something similar to what John already knows. In their days, because they were ruled by the Romans, they, they were under the Roman colonizers, the Roman Empire was their colonizer. The Roman emperors were also treated like gods, okay? So they would be declared as gods. And in a year, there would be sometimes one or more days dedicated to the worship of the emperor, which was known as Emperor Day, okay? So on Emperor Day, every citizen of the Roman Empire, wherever the Romans are in control, you had to then go to the nearest temple, um, a, a Roman temple, where you would make your offerings to the emperor who was ruling um, at that time. So they would have their statues there and uh, other gods as well. You would get there, you would make your sacrifices and so on. And when you are done making your sacrifices, the priest would then issue you a, a very a small scroll, okay? And that scroll would simply just confirm that you did go and you did a, a practice your emperor worship, okay? Now, that practice, what they would then do, once you get your scroll, you could then go back and do your business. But what you would need to do, if you own a shop or whatever business you own, even if you own a hotel, it doesn't matter the business you have. You could be a, a, a blacksmith. You know you are ma making swords and, and weapons. Doesn't matter the business. You would take that little scroll and you would nail it outside your business, okay? That scroll was like a license to do business for the year. It was a sign that you have complied with emperor worship, okay? So when the soldiers, for example, are, are, are doing their patrolling, when the tax collectors are doing their patrolling, if they see that your business does not have that certificate outside, you would then be regarded as someone who is not allowed to do business and your business would be shut down. This is where then this comes from, that those who don't have the mark of the beast were neither allowed to buy nor to sell. See, John would know the original context, that the original context is emperor worship, where if you don't participate in emperor worship, you would not be allowed to buy nor to sell. And that is why, and by the way, this is very important for Christians um, to know. That is why then the Christians of the early church and Jews, they decided to be self-sustaining. They decided to run their own businesses, own their own farms, own their own buildings, so that they didn't have to participate in emperor worship in order to survive economically. 
by running their own business, their own institutions, and trading with each other, they were able to avoid emperor worship, but not starve. Okay? And this is something that I, I have presented quite repeatedly and passionately among Adventists uh, for, for, for years. And, and, you know, I'm sort of realizing that it will never take off. You know, you will never, ever, ever control your worship if you don't control the economy that is behind your worship. If you want to worship God freely, you need to start controlling your money because whoever controls your money controls your worship. Okay? Whoever controls the economy controls when you will worship, how long you will worship. And, and so the Jews in particular and the Muslims, they learned that very well and very easy. That is why you will see Jews and Muslims are probably the two religions in the world that are, are very pro-business, extremely pro-business. Why are they so pro-business? It's because they never ever want their religion, their worship, their spirituality to be controlled by somebody else. Okay? By running their own businesses, they close them when they want to, when they want to go pray they close them. When it's Sabbath, they close them. And no one can say to them, why did you close your shop? Because they own the business. The difficulty with Christianity is that we do not own any businesses in defense of our faith. We just own businesses for money's sake. But these guys are different. Jews and Arabs, they did not necessarily go into business for money. Their first move to business was because they wanted to protect their worship. And then the prophets came after. And there's a very uh, interesting uh, saying that says, um, when you take care of God's business, God will make it his business to take care of your business. You can see, you can see how profitable their businesses are, whether it's Muslims or it's Jews. You can see that the, the, the statement is true. When someone goes into business with the aim of protecting their worship, I think God will always be there for your business. And it's something that has troubled me a lot about Seventh-day Adventists um, over the years. Um, we own nothing. We own nothing, yet we want to influence the world. I mean, you want to teach people the health message, you have no farms. You are not food producers. You don't own retailers that sell the food. So what do Adventists do? They are just giving free speech without any market behind it to support that speech. We, 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 look, our church is really not different to politicians. We just want to stand there and parrot a whole lot of good things. Eat like this, not like that. Don't do this, don't do that. Yet we don't own any farms. Because if you want to change the way the world eats, start buying land. Start controlling the food chain. That is how you change the world. When you start producing a certain quality of food, then the supermarkets will put it on their shelves. Right now, we are screaming to the world, stop eating meat, meat is unhealthy. Stop eating fast food, uh, fast food is unhealthy. What do you own? What do you own? Where is your version of McDonald's that is healthy? Where are our farms that are producing the alternative? Do you understand what I'm saying? So it's very important. For me, the one very missing thing, and by the way, by the way, this is something that Ellen White was very much disappointed on. When you read uh, from the year 1891, all the way going to her years in Australia, she kept shouting the same message. 
the Adventist church needs to acquire land and enter into commercial farming so that our health message is not a theory, but it is actually backed up by the food we deliver into the supermarkets. We seem to have listened to her on every other thing except those things that are strategic, okay? You, you, you go to countries like Zimbabwe, Malawi, Zambia, you find Adventists proud. They tell you that uh, the Adventist church is over a million members. Yes, a million members who own what? What's the point? What's the point of saying there are 900,000 uh, uh, Adventists in Zimbabwe or 1.1 million Adventists in Malawi? And then what? With those numbers, do you shape the future of the country? I mean, with 900,000 people, just think about it. 900,000 Zimbabweans are Adventists. Then tell me why are corrupt people still in power? I mean, people win elections by 50,000 votes more than, the opposition, than their uh, opposition. With 900,000 votes coming from a single group of people with a single mindset, you mean to tell me that by now, Zimbabwe would not be a country where every president is aligned to Adventist teachings? Do you understand what I'm saying? The challenge that we have as Adventists is that we speak a lot, but when it comes to putting investment we don't go there. And I wish we could study the Jews and the Arabs more. See, those guys, actually, they are not so much about shouting to the world what they believe. But behind the scenes, they buy the assets that make the world listen to them. Okay? And, and when you look here in Revelation 13 and 14, because I'm connecting the two, that's the problem. The reason why the, the image of the beast can control whether we can buy and sell, it's because at the time of this vision, it is clear Christians have not adopted a self-sustaining economic model. This is why the devil will control our buying and selling. Because we have not developed an independent economic system, which makes us not to be dependent on things that are already devil controlled. I think in uh, 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 2018, I'm not, uh, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, um, when I was uh, there in, in, in the UK with the couples at, at the retreat, someone raised this question and I had to, 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 to attend to it that even the idea that you find Christian families falling apart uh, in Europe, in the UK, it speaks to that. It speaks to that because everyone you speak to in the UK, they are telling you, pastor life is hard here. We are working two or three jobs. We, we hardly have time to see our children. And I say, but how come that is an African problem? Why is it not happening with these other uh, 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 races and cultures? Do you know why? They follow the same model. You see, when the Russians move to the UK, they buy in the same neighborhood. All Russians you will find in the same neighborhoods of London. Why? Because when they take over a neighborhood, they take over the shops, they take over the schools. Now, what does that do? It creates an environment where they can raise their children for each other, with each other. They are no longer isolated. Africans are isolated in the UK. Isolated. You are not providing social structures to each other. You are not attacking a neighborhood together buying houses in that neighborhood, taking over the schools to the point that the school teachers become one of your own into those same schools. That is what the Jews do when they move to a country. That is what the Russians, the Chinese, 
the Indians do because they know when they control their economy, their education, their religion is also protected. Their marriages are protected. Everything becomes protected. Unfortunately, if there's one thing that colonialism did well in Africa, it is to make Africans compete with each other rather than working with each other. And when you read the book of Revelation, that is what you see. You see a fragmented Christianity. That is why the little horn, that is why the image of the beast can control whether we can buy or sell. Because the vision is a sad testimony that unfortunately, it looks like even up to the second coming of Jesus, Christianity will never come together as a unit that can work together. Because if we were to build institutions that are loyal to our faith and our religion, then no one would be able to force us to buy or to sell where we don't want to buy or sell. We would be in control. We would be in control. We wouldn't be having debates about, um, you know, the types of food that we need to eat. Consider Buddhists, for example. There's a reason why Buddhists focus on living in rural areas. Because they know that the kind of food they eat is not supported by mass production. So the primary duty of a, a Buddhist is to be at one with nature and produce the food that is aligned to their faith and spirituality. And so those are the challenges that you see here. For the devil to control the buying and selling of Christians, it is because we failed to act as one. That's the problem. Even with us in the Adventist church, that's the problem. All we know is going to the, the GC session to do what? To fight political battles that are getting us nowhere. We are busy collecting tithes and offerings, sending them to upper structures, and that money disappears. By now, all those billions of dollars should have bought farms all over the world. We should be owning juice companies, eh, 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 you know, eh, 100% distilled spring water companies. We should be owning a, a franchises that, that sell high quality healthy food. Instead of just preaching without taking action, that is how the devil gets to control what you buy or sell. And, and, and I would challenge you to read uh, very carefully the end of, of Revelation chapter 13 and see there the danger of neglecting economic control up to the point where the devil takes over and now you've got no room you can't buy you can't sell because the devil has taken over everything there is a need for us to re-evaluate our a, a, a approach to business as adventists if we can start thinking collectively about creating a market, social markets that are in defense of our faith, we may find that we are not as susceptible to the influences of the evil one in the economies of this world when we have our own economic independence um, into these issues. And I, I really would plead with all of us, think about this, think about this very well. You are in the UK. I'm not saying you are rich. No, I am not saying so. But you are in an economy that has more a, a power in terms of currency. If you all came together, set up a, a, an investment fund where you put in five pounds, 10 pounds, 20 pounds, and together you started to acquire land in Zimbabwe, in South Africa, in Malawi, in Zambia. Imagine if all Africans in Europe used the strength of the euro and the pound to actually acquire vast pieces of land in Africa. And then you hired your fellow African Adventists who were unemployed 
and started proper commercial farming projects which are designed to bring into the markets healthy, high-grade food while at the same time setting the tone for the economic independence of the church from the economic manipulations of the capitalist world that the devil controls. Instead of just running around, you know, holding health expos and, and telling people what to eat and what not to eat, we could develop a much more sustainable plan of actually controlling what ends up in the shelves. But, you know, I, I don't know, maybe we'll get there, maybe we'll not. But I see an opportunity at the end of Revelation 13 for us to think differently about how we want to be economically controlled, how we want to have our independence in terms of our financial sustainability um, as, 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 as a church. You know, um, I, I, I like property. Uh, I'm someone who follows property developments a lot. And I remember not long ago, um, I was just following some property developments in Spain. And so I ended up following this um, a, a documentary and shock of my life when that guy was talking about some of the world's best wine producing farms in Spain and Portugal are actually owned by the Vatican. They are the property of the Vatican. And when this guy was showing them, these are internationally renowned uh, 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 wineries, okay? I'm just making an example. Of course, we wouldn't go into wine because we do not promote uh, 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 the use nor consumption of alcohol. But I'm just giving you an example. And, and I read a report, um, I think it was four years ago, that said if the Catholic Church was to continue in its trajectory of investments, by the year 2035, 51% of their income will be coming from their businesses and their investments. And only 49% will be coming from tithes and offerings and donations. Think about that for a moment. Think about that for a moment, that there are actually churches that have seen it and we have not. I, I, I suppose sometimes we want to comfort ourselves by saying we are preaching the second coming of Jesus. Yes, but the second coming of Jesus and the preaching of the gospel on our side needs money. On Jesus' side, it doesn't. But on our side, it needs money. It needs money. To preach the gospel, money is needed. And because we need money, the church cannot always be depending on tithes and offerings. Look at what is happening now during COVID-19. So many of our members lost their jobs and pastors have had to be uh, retrenched all over the world. This wouldn't happen in an institution that is financially independent and has a very viable business model. We would be able to to, 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 to subsidize salaries in times of difficulty. And so for me, one of the biggest takeaways of Revelation 13, the last part where we are told that the image of the beast controls the buying and selling, is that we must learn from the early church. The early church made itself independent from the Roman economy by making sure that they built their own economy on the side one that allowed their religion, faith, spirituality, not to be controlled by somebody else. Now, this mark of the beast, as we spoke about it, that reveals itself in economic, uh, political, uh, as well as spiritual dimensions. As Revelation 13 showed us, millions of people then take this side. Now, at the beginning of Revelation 14, Christ responds to Revelation 13 because in Revelation 13, the beast has marked his people 
through the triple six method, okay? Through his control of politics, economics, and spirituality, he has marked these people. But in Revelation 14, Christ responds. The response of Jesus Christ is to say to the beast, you do not have control over everyone in the world. That is why Revelation 14 now opens with a different group. Remember, Revelation 13 ended with a group that is marked by the mark of the beast, triple six. Revelation 14 opens with a group that is marked by the mark of Jesus Christ. And they are called the 144,000. As you can see, it is an opposition of numbers. The other one uses triple six as a symbolic sign to his people. This one uses 144,000 as a symbolic sign. This is why, for example, we can, there is just no evidence in the book of Revelation to suggest that the 144,000 are a literal number because these are symbolic numbers responding to each other. There's a symbolic number that is about the sealing of those who belong to the beast, the mark of the beast. And Christ responds with his symbolic number, which represents those who are in him. So, triple six, those who are in the beast. 144,000, those who are in Christ. These are symbolic numbers. Both of them stand for the values of these. Now, how do we know what triple six stands for? Well, we studied it. Remember? We went through Genesis, created on the sixth day, the, son of, the throne of Solomon. We went to the Nebuchadnezzar and the plain of Jura, the statue of six cubits by six, six core cubits uh, by uh, six cubits and six cubits, you remember? And so we were able to establish that at the center of triple six is the divinity of humanity. When humanity elevates itself higher than God to control economic spirituality and politics. So we were able to unlock what does it mean so that we can identify wherever it plays. Now, the same thing must happen in Revelation 14. If we want to understand what Revelation 14 stands for, we need, I mean, 144,000 stands for. We must do the same exercise as we did with the triple six and with the beast. So again, what do we know about this 144,000? Okay, at least number wise, we have one of the quickest clues that it is in divisions and multiplications of 12. Okay, so what would we know about 12 that matters in the Bible? We would know that there are 12 tribes of Israel. We would know that Christ himself chose 12 disciples, okay? And we could follow this pattern everywhere. We could find it in the 12 ornament stones in the breastplate of the high priest. We could find it in the 12 loaves of the shoe bread in the sanctuary, okay? We could also find it in the 12 gates of the new Jerusalem. So we can already see the pattern there. But also just like we did with triple six, we relied on the behavior of the beast to see some of the meaning. We can also rely on the behavior of Jesus to see some of the meaning of 144,000. In fact, we are given uh, in verse 12, Revelation 14 verse 12, we are given part of that important clue that the, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who, uh, who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. All right. So we now know also that this 144,000 can be marked by two things as well. They have the faith of Jesus. And that could mean two things. That could mean they have faith in Jesus, but also that they have the same faith in God that Jesus had in God. They have the faith of Jesus. Okay. So he has given them his faith, that they should exercise his faith on God, just like he had faith in God. And so, and of course, when we study the phrase in Greek, both of them seem to be the meaning that uh, Christ meant, that those who are his, they do not only have faith in him, but they also have the faith in God that he had in God, of course. That 
would link up very well with what Jesus says in, in, in John 14, okay? Remember, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God and believe also in me. When Jesus introduces us to that a, a, a proper functioning of faith, faith in God and faith in him, okay? But also why? Because he himself has faith in God, okay? I now go to prepare a place for you in my father's house are many mansions. So we know then that the 144,000, by the use of the multiple of 12 and divisions of 12 in the 144,000, we know that God regards these as his own people just like he regarded Israel. Number two, we know also that these have the faith of Jesus Christ in both ways. They have faith in Jesus and they have the faith of Jesus in God. Number three, we know that they are the keepers of the commandments of God. We know that they do not deviate from their obedience to God. Is that the only thing we know? No, it's not the only thing. We also know when we read in the earlier verses, that we are also told in verse 4, that these ones have not defiled themselves with women. They are virgins, okay? And here what is important is not so much the virginity of the body, but its symbolism as well as defiled by women. Also, we need to understand that in the right context. Very, very important. Because remember, in the Bible, sex between a married couple is holy. So the Bible would never describe sleeping with your wife as defilement. But when we read the book of Leviticus, we know that defilement is when a, an unmarried man and an unmarried woman sleep with each other, or a, a married man sleeps with an unmarried woman, or a married woman sleeps with an unmarried man, or a married woman and a married man sleep with each other, but they are not married to each other. They are married to other people, okay? So here, we have at least the book of Leviticus to guide us that when verse 4 says, they did not defile themselves with women, okay? Then we know that the meaning here is not to suggest that sleeping with, with a woman uh, is going to be a defilement, but what it is explaining must be read in the context of Leviticus, that these ones did not desire joy that is found outside of God's holy parameters. Because remember, in this case, defilement is when a man or a woman seeks sexual gratification and joy outside of the holiness of marriage. And so here we know that what the Bible is then saying is that these people, they refused to participate in anything, even if it was going to give them joy, as long as that joy needed to be gained outside of God's parameters, okay? So that is the symbolism there. And for that reason, they are pure. Pure in the sense that they, they shun to do evil. They shun to, to disobey the will and the law of God, okay? So, again, if then we are looking for the 144,000, what are, should we be looking for? Well, we need to be looking first and foremost for people who truly believe that they are God's people. Now, remember, follow me very carefully. We said the 144,000 is in the multiples of 12. We said that it symbolizes the nation of Israel. But how did Israel become God's nation? We know Genesis 15 verse 6, and Abraham believed in God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Remember that? And then God made a covenant with him. So the Israelites didn't choose themselves as God's people. It was a covenant of faith. So how then do the 144,000 become God's people? There's a covenant of faith sealed in the blood of Jesus. This is what makes them God's people. Secondly, what makes them God's people is the faith and the testimony that they have in Jesus. Three, 
it is the obedience to the commandments um, of God. Four, it is the refusal to be defiled. In other words, it is the refusal to participate in a joy that does not come from within the borders of the kingdom of God. And so if we are looking for the 144,000, the same way as we were guided in Revelation, guided in Revelation 13, about triple six, the same characteristics are needed. That is why I said when we were reading Revelation 13, it is not enough to simply just say triple six represents the papacy. The devil would not attempt to control the world through just one institution. Triple six is everywhere in the, in the financial sector, in politics, in science, in religion, in spirituality. The devil is everywhere trying to gain control. Equally, equally, the 144,000 cannot, under any circumstances, just be associated with us Adventists. Absolutely not. While we do meet some of the criteria, we are not the only ones. Okay? John chapter 16, he says it. I have many sheep uh, that are mine, which are in many other pens, which I will bring into the fold in the end, okay? So it cannot be that the characteristics of the 144,000 must somehow be sought after only in the Adventist church. No. These characteristics, just like triple six, these characteristics will be found in many places anywhere around the world. There are many people who are God-fearing, truly God-loving, following and obeying individuals who are in many denominations scattered all over the world. Catholics, Methodists, Adventists, everywhere. You name it, God has people there. And it's important in our reading of 144,000 to remember how God had to correct the prophet um, Elijah. Do you remember when the prophet was hiding in the cave and God came to the prophet and asked, why are you here? What are you doing here? Wh who are you hiding from? And he says, I am hiding uh, from Jezebel who is persecuting me because I am the only one. I am the only one standing up for you. And God says to him, no, you are not the only one. There are actually 50 other prophets um, who are standing for me. Okay? Always very, very important. While I certainly, biblically, can and do support the, the very much, very biblically firm teaching that the Adventist church is the remnant church. Very important also, we are not the only definition of the remnant. God has his people in many, many other places around the world. To be a remnant, it does not mean you've got to belong to a particular denomination. More than anything, it means you must have commitment to this. Commitment to the word of God, though the heavens might fall. And remember, dear friends, I, I want to stress this very clearly um, be, because it's some of the things that we, we find challenging. You know, there are many, many, many things that are wrong in the Adventist church that need to be corrected. Yet, millions of Adventists around the world, though knowing that these things are there, they remain in the church. They prefer to work with these things from the inside. They don't leave. Now, this is where I get fascinated. Why do we believe we must stay in our church and fix it? Yet we expect Catholics to leave their church. That, that never makes sense to me. If you believe your church is worth staying in in spite of its mistakes, then why should others leave their churches? They also want to fix them from the inside. Okay? They, they are, uh, uh, like I said, when you read, you get to see a lot. There are many Catholic priests and bishops who write extensively questioning the many things they see. For example, in the Catholic Church, questioning the statues, the prayers. But they won't leave. Why won't they leave? The same reason why Adventist pastors don't leave. Because we believe there's a lot of good that can be done from the inside, even though there are challenges that you see. 
Now, we have a tendency as Adventists to say, if we preach some, to someone and they don't leave their church and come here, what do we say? We start saying the, a, a spiritual threats. Yeah, they have rejected knowledge. They have rejected knowledge. God will judge them. No. <laughs> they have received the knowledge. But it is their right to use that knowledge to improve the church they belong to. There's no verse in the Bible that says they must now leave their church and come to yours. Why have you not left? In spite of the problems that are here, why have you not left? If you believe God is working in this church in spite of its mistakes, why can't he work in other churches in spite of their mistakes? So do you see that the hypocrisy sometimes in our evangelism, expecting other people to leave their churches when we would not be willing to leave ours? There's a hypocrisy there. In fact, my, my view is this, and it is supported by what Jesus did. You know, whenever Jesus healed people, whenever Jesus uh, had raised people from the dead, he would refuse for them to follow him. He would instruct them to go back to where they come from. Do you know why? The gospel will spread faster if we send people back to where they belong rather than collecting everyone under one denomination. Teach the gospel. Let people meet the real Jesus. Then send them back to where they came from to agitate, to start asking the right questions so that where they came from, people there also may begin to ask, where did you hear this? Share more. Because when we are all here, now who's preaching there? So our idea of evangelism sometimes is very much a capitalistic. It's all about collecting and bringing here. But Jesus was very socialist in his evangelism. He didn't want people running around him. They were of no use to him. He wanted them back there, back to those families that rejected them because they had leprosy. Back to those families that rejected them because they were demon-possessed. That's why he needed them, showing those communities that we have met the real Savior. And I think one of the things that needs to change in our uh, evangelism strategy is the idea of baptizing people into the membership of the Adventist church. It's capitalistic. We are collecting people into one fold. And in so doing, we are slowing down the gospel. We need to be preaching the gospel, baptizing people and sending them back like Jesus would do. Like Jesus would do. He would send them back. He sent the demoniac back. He sent many he healed from leprosy back. He sent the woman with the issue of blood back. He always sent them back so that they may do the gospel work there, there. And you see here, when we look at the 144,000, we are seeing a people that are justified by faith, a people that are committed to the word of God. And I'm saying they are not just going to be found in one denomination. God's people are going to be found everywhere. And our duty as the remnant church, now listen to the difference. We are the remnant church. We are not the only remnant people, but we are the remnant church. And I think we are missing the point. The duty of the remnant church is to train and release, not keep. Train and release. Train and release so that people go out there and change the world. Okay, and, and, and so when we are looking for the 144,000, we're not looking for a denomination. We are looking for the footprint of God's presence everywhere um, in the world. Then um, from there, he sees the vision of the three angels, okay? Uh, of course, 
Revelation 14 from verse 6 is extremely, extremely, extremely important to the Seventh-day Adventist church. The three angels' message is the cornerstone of the Adventist prophetic message together with Daniel 8 verse 14 unto 2,300 days and evenings. Then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. These two are the bedrock um, of the Adventist prophetic message, okay? And when we get to the three angels' message, what are we dealing with? Very briefly, angel number one has an everlasting gospel to preach. And what is he saying to the world? Fear God, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. So again, I, I want you to pay attention. This is where I will see whether you were listening all along uh, in Revelation 13 and in the book of Daniel. Look at again what is happening. First angel addresses worship. Who should be worshipped? God and God alone. The first angel echoes the, the, the words of Solomon. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Second angel. Listen to the second angel. Then I saw another angel. What is the second angel saying? The second angel saying, she has fallen. Who has fallen? The great Babylon has fallen. That, uh, 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 and this particular Babylon had made all nations drink from the cup of a fornication. Now we know what the second angel is talking about. Remember? Remember in the book of Daniel, um, Daniel chapter 4? Do you remember how Nebuchadnezzar would describe Babylon? Before God made him eat grass, he said, Behold, is this not the great Babylon that I have built with my own hands? So the angel is giving us a clue here. Okay, we know where this phrase comes from great Babylon. It came from Nebuchadnezzar. But listen to what is happening. Now the second angel is talking about the fall of a, a, a Babylon, which in other words is a political system because Babylon was a state. It was a political power. And we know also this because we are told that she made other nations. Okay. So you can see there's a clear political, governmental, national thing that was happening here. The, 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 the angel says the power of Babylon to politically deceive nations is now taken away. Babylon has fallen. Babylon can no longer politically control the nations of this world. And then the third one, okay, the third angel says, if anyone worships the beast or his image or receives the mark on the forehead, okay, he himself will drink from the wine of the wrath of God. Now, this one is addressing that idea of worshipping the image in order. Remember Revelation 13? The image of the beast is worshipped so that people can buy or sell. What did you just notice to show that you were listening with all my screaming in all these weeks when we've been doing this, particularly Revelation 13? The three angels' message is the direct destruction of the three powers of the beast. Did you see? The first beast demanded to be worshipped. The first angel announces only God should be worshipped. The second beast had political power to make other nations worship the image of the beast. The second angel says the political power of the beast to make other nations drunk has been destroyed. The third, which is the image of the beast, used the economy to force people into worship. The third angel now says those who chose the image of the beast in order to have access to the economy, they now are going to be destroyed. Did you ever pay attention to that? That the three angels' message announces how God destroys the three powers of the devil on earth. His political, spiritual, and economic power. The power that he had in Revelation 13. In Revelation 14, God destroys it. Why? Because his hour of judgment has come. 
He is stripping the devil of all the power he has been exercising on earth because judgment has begun. Okay? And so the three angels' message is a message of the sovereignty of God. It is a message that confirms that God has the reins of this world. Though the devil may for a period be exercising these three powers, the three angels make an announcement to the world that these powers no longer apply. The devil has no authority anymore. All these powers have been seized by God. No one will be worshipped but God. No nations will be controlled but by God. No image will force others to worship in order to be able to buy or sell except God himself because he now will cut off those who chose the image um, of the beast. Okay, So the three angels message is a message of confirmation of the rulership of God. The worship, the rulership, and the control um, of God. And as he sees all of this, rightly so, now that the devil has been stripped of his powers and the whole universe is now aware that God alone should be worshipped, then John sees the last part of Revelation 14. Then he sees Jesus carrying a, a sickle. Now, a sickle is very easy to understand when you come from the rural areas. A, a sickle is used to either cut grass or to harvest, particularly wheat and barley. It's a very good cutter uh, for the stocks of plants, very quick and efficient um, as well. I, I, I grew up in a, in, a, in a setting where roofs were made using uh, grass. For, for thatching. So uh, the, the, the grannies would wake up uh, very early uh, to cut the grass while the shoots are tender and moist uh, from the dew before the sun dries them and firms them up. Okay, So the sickle is a very quick cutting and a, a, a weapon or, or, or garden uh, tool. Now, Christ now is seen carrying a sickle. And an angel says, the earth is ready. The earth is ready for the harvest of those who have not defiled themselves. Remember, we are now going back to connecting with the first verses of Revelation 14. In other words, the earth, the 144,000, the faithful ones, those who bear your testimony, they are ready. They are ripe for you to harvest them. And so, a sickle is thrown on earth and it harvests. But is that all? No. The Bible says another angel comes with a sickle. And another angel comes out of the temple and shouts to that one. That throw your sickle as well. Two harvests. Two harvests. That is very important. Because by using two harvests, the Bible may be symbolizing the extent to which the grace of God is willing to make sure absolutely no one is left behind. The earth is harvested twice to make sure that anyone who truly believes in the Son of God, who truly wants the, 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 the mercy of God through the grace that is found in Jesus, is not left behind. The earth is ready for harvest. When Jesus had arrived in Samaria and he asked his disciples to go and get some food. While he was there, the Samaritan woman came. We remember the story. When they spoke and when the disciples came, they were shocked. Now there were so many Samaritans there who had been called by this woman. And Jesus was preaching to them. And when the disciples came to Jesus saying, you sent us to go get food, we got the food, the food is here, now we can eat. Jesus says to them, I am already full. 
the fields are white and are ready for harvest. What was Jesus talking about? He was using a, a, a agricultural a metaphor. You see, the Samaritans, they used to wear very white linen. It's one of the ways the Samaritans would set themselves apart from the Jews. Samaritans wore white linen. And when Jesus says to the disciples, the fields are white, he is saying to them, Samaria is ready. I have started the work of preaching the gospel. There's the hearts of the Samaritans are ready to receive the good news. And this is how Revelation 14 ends. With the two angels saying, those who accept the gospel of Jesus, then know that God is ready to harvest. God is ready to harvest. The question is, do you believe? And will you be part of the harvest? The three angels' message is the destruction of the three powers of the devil. The message of the 144,000 is a direct opposition to the message of triple six. It is those who are sealed by God versus those who are sealed by the devil. And the good news is that those who are sealed in Christ are victorious in the end. Let's pray together. Kind and loving Heavenly Father, God in the highest, an honor of grace is bestowed upon us this evening to once again come to learn that if we keep the faith, that if we keep the commandments at the harvesting of the earth, Heavenly Father, your cycle of grace will not miss us. Mm. And Father, this evening I pray, may we be among this 144,000. May we be among those who did not seek for joy outside of your parameters. Those who kept your faith and those who kept your commandments. This we pray through Christ Jesus. Amen.